Welcome everyone to uh, another wonderful session of Ecosystem Engage, the not so daily show. Uh, I'm joined today by um, two stalwarts of the industry, um, Sandeep Bhargav, who is uh, not new to the technology ecosystem in, in Asia Pacific. He's been with some of the largest uh, technology providers over the years uh, in various leadership roles and is now uh, the managing director for Rackspace for Asia Pacific. So uh, welcome Sandeep. Thank you, Amit. And I'm also joined by um, uh, not so young, but uh, very, very uh, credible uh, analyst in uh, in the community who's been who's been uh, reviewing the market for the last 20 years. He's fondly known as a devil's advocate, probably the best devil's advocate in the technology ecosystem in Asia Pacific. Phil Hasse. Phil Hasse. Uh, Phil's been in the research advisory space. Uh, for over 20 years, and he's worked um, on various technology areas such as IT services initially, and then evolved to uh, you know new service delivery models, emerging technology, then covering the digital transformation uh, segment. So, welcome, Phil. Thanks, Simon. Always good to talk, and great to have a you know interactive discussion. Fantastic. So, look, I am looking forward to um, having some some interesting talking points and questions being uh, being put into the session today. Um, the session is going to be focused, obviously, given the background that you guys bring on, on um, the technology landscape and how it's shifting uh, and talking about fun topics like cloud and automation and, and so on. But before I get into that, um, I, I, I wanted to delve a little bit into uh, some of the steps that you're taking, Sandeep, in your organization as a leader. Now, you know, one of the things that's become very evident uh, over the past couple of months, and I maintain this, that you know, we're not in an economic crisis. You know, we are facing uh, the worst humanitarian crisis that the world has ever faced, in, in, at least in our generation, and the economic crisis is just a fallout of that. So it's a watershed moment, and I think it means there's gonna be lots and lots of shifts and societal shifts that have uh, been pending for decades uh, are, are taking place um, you know, in a matter of weeks. We're going to see some shifts in, in patterns that will become permanent and some that may sort of revert to the way it used to be uh, as we come out of the COVID scenario, which we hope is, um, is soon. But uh, nonetheless, I think there's going to be a lot of change we'll see in the way we live our lifestyles, the way we run our businesses. So, you know, with that, there's been a lot of talk about, um, you know, remote management and, and, and so on. But I think the number one thing that counts is leadership and empathy and a sense of purpose uh, for organizations it's taking uh, the teams through this. Um, so I wanted to get get your perspective on, you know, how are you keeping, you know, your teams engaged, inspired, uh, and motivated more than ever with a sense of purpose uh, to get through this. Uh, I mean, great question. Uh, you know, some of this is. You know, uh, the way teams work and react in situations and they come out of situations is actually not just a moment in time, but it, it is gradual building towards that. And I think that space culture that has got built over the years, the flexibility, the openness that we've exhibited as a company, even though, you know, new leaders come in uh, and leaderships change and people change. Uh, Rackspace has done an amazing job at keeping that culture constant over the last 20 plus years, right? So... We, you know, we recognize in Asia Pacific that a pandemic uh, was coming our way, way back in first week of February. Uh, we saw the signs and we basically gave our Hong Kong and Singapore office complete freedom to decide what they want to do and how they want to do it. Right? And, and we basically moved to work from home even before a lot of companies had realized or had thought about what to do. Uh, and it was it was freedom at that point. It was choice at that point. You know, second week of February, I went to office and I was surprised to see only like 10% or 15% of my staff turning up. But, you know, but our work continued, right? First week of March, uh, our global leadership started seeing the emergence in US and they started getting worried. Uh, and we, we checked whether we could do work from home. And pretty much second week of March, we were pretty much work from home. Proactively, we announced that we will extend work from home everywhere till uh, end of May. And we are already proactively thinking about either how to best get to work or how to extend this arrangement uh, towards the end of 
August, September time frame, right? Uh, so that's that's still conversations that are underway. But we are doing this and uh, talking about it proactively, and this is something that we've communicated to our employees almost on a you know weekly basis. So we talk to the leaders every week, and we talk to all the employees every two weeks, uh, and we make sure that there are internal blogs that people know what's happening, right? Uh, plus, as a leadership team, we used to meet three times a week. Uh, as a crisis team, we meet every every day. But as a leadership team, we meet three times a week. We looked at uh, our data centers, are they operating? Our customers, are they operating? And our employees, what they're feeling? And one of the things we realized was, uh, you know, what can we do that was a meaningful gesture for employees? And, you know, we, we mailed masks to all our employees, six and a half thousand employees. So people in Asia started getting the masks this week and they were really pleasantly surprised. And you can see a lot of posts on LinkedIn thanking a CEO for that gesture, right? Uh, we uh, also, you know, started hearing the employees on what is really oh, worrying them, right? So initially it was about, I'm locked with my kids in a room, you know, will the company be flexible um, in, you know, if my kids just pop up in the background and all. And we did some messaging on how to run meetings, how to be more tolerant to people, etc. Now we're realizing what people are saying is, is our life is Zoom and Zoom is a life. How do we get this segregation? And we are proactively again, you know, we pool in our thinking and we're going to take some steps to educate uh, people on how best to run Zoom meetings, how best to run your days and how best to maintain that personal professional segregation, right? Um, but we are being ahead of the game. We also work with uh, some of the therapists and extended those services to our people. So, you know, these are very genuine, proactive actions even before people could ask for, right? In some parts of our offices, people said, look, I'm used to monitors. Um, I'm used to an office chair. You know, I can't really be sitting on my dining table chair. And we allowed, we opened our offices and said, you can take monitors and you can take chairs, right? All around the world. All you have to do is just let your let your boss know but just remember if you don't return that chair and that monitor then you'll be without the chair and monitor when you return back to work right <laughs> so these are you know these are genuine uh, uh things that you know were done proactively thinking what and hearing to the employees what they were saying and what they were talking about and just adapting to it um Apart from that, you know, we started an initiative where we had employees talk to us about how they're managing professional personal life, how they're managing customers. And we started both an internal blog as well as an external blog on LinkedIn. And that has garnered a lot of comments from all around the world, even non Rackspace employees on, you know, and, you know, my blog attracts like about 5,000 to 6,000 views. And it's, you know, for the people who have written their stories, it just gives them pleasure that their voice is getting heard, right? So, so small things, it doesn't take you any much money, right? In all of this collectively, we've not really spent too much money. But what we've done is we found little ways in showing people that we genuinely care, right? A lot of people are worried about what happens, you know, businesses are impacted. When is, when am I, when am I going to lose my job? Because they are seeing people getting furloughed in the industry, right? And we've worked really hard in protecting every single job that we can at this point of time, right? You know, of course, we're in a business like pretty much like everybody else, but we have proactively worked and proactively assured people because that's the other thing that people need that, you know, would I be out in the market in these times? So all these things collectively together, right, uh, has just meant that people feel much more, you know, much more confident that they can get to their work without really having to worry about all the things and the company is actually taking care of them. Plus, you know, we've got an amazing culture too. So, uh, in all the countries. So in Asia Pac, uh, our culture ambassador sits in Australia. He runs these band parties once a, once a month where we all get and play Halo on our uh, laptops. Uh, you know, we've done team exercises. Uh, uh, we had like one of, one of us show us the way in exercising as a team. And so, you know, different ways we had... Uh, a customer roundtable lunch where we serve burgers via Uber Eats to our customers in Australia. So people are finding, you know, these little ways of connecting people and it's all organic movement, right? And, but again, they're working in a company that gives them that flexibility to try out new things, right? That's, that's so, what it is. It's amazing the little things. Yeah, the little gestures like um, providing mastering your employees or, or, you know, sending burgers to your customers. It's, it's, as you say, it didn't cost you much money, 
it doesn't take much effort, but it's these little gestures that empower employees and go, this, yeah, they're thinking of me, they have me, and it's genuine that you have your employees and your customers um, at the centerpiece of what you're trying to do. And I think that's one thing that we've really learned. One little gestures are important and things can be done really quickly if they have to. You, you probably wouldn't have thought in yeah. January, early January that you would be Uber eating burgers and to your employees. Uh, sorry, to yeah. your customers. You wouldn't think of that, but it, it yeah. didn't take much to organize it. So, uh, I was going to say a phone call, but it's down like, you know, it's a, uh, not a phone call these days. It's, it's on the app and the burgers are yeah, delivered. Well, you, you, uh, we, all, we all need exercise, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, the only thing I'm not happy about is the cows have moved. <laughs> I, I need to go. <laughs> they were all just here and they've moved. Uh, look. So I have to go and find them. Now. They have literally all moved behind the trees. So I have to now go and uh, get a photo of them for you. Wait, I take I photos of them all day. I love them. Yeah. You know, I always do. I, I would take up, yeah, there's always, because we've got lots of calves at the moment. Yeah. And they're all so cute. You know, who, forget what happens later. They're all cute now. And um, I'm always taking photos of them, but I'll take a broader one for you. Uh, before we move on, I have to make a statement. Um, for the record, I coined the term baby zoomers. And I want to make sure that this is recorded in this video before anyone else <laughs> takes claim to that. This is the baby what? zoomer generation. Um, <laughs> don't, don't, don't put too much baby in them. I was talking to my mother on the weekend. A 92-year-old lady organized her quilting club on Zoom. I know. And the lady who organized it was 92 for her, her quilting club. So it's not just the babies who are doing this. This look technology. We so what what it shows us is that technology straddles all spectrums of society. Yeah. Um, no. Look, it's it's been it's been wonderful to see how the world's coming together. Uh, in this in these times of social distancing, emotional distancing has reduced tremendously. Right. And and I think we've seen that not just in our personal lives, but also with our employees, our customers, and and, and partners. So we'll we'll talk about that um, as as we go on. But some some just a question around. Um, I guess the impact of technology in the current crisis, but more importantly, um, you know, which are the sectors in your view that will need to adapt really rapidly? They should be thinking about it now in terms of how to adapt technology um, to, um, to be able to thrive uh, in the post-COVID era. Actually, I mean, the answer is pretty much everybody. <laughs> So, you know, of course, there are, there are people who are much impacted, right? Because their businesses are completely shut down. Gym owners, restaurant owners, restaurants, the whole movie making industry, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are industries like supply chain, logistics, you know, manufacturing that is impacted. Uh, may not be 100%, but so every industry is impacted. But, you know, you should, if you see specific things, uh, you know, are you... Are you enabled to sign contracts uh, on electronically? And are you able to pay bills or raise invoices electronically from home? We found so many customers, like so many in industries which you think are spending tons of money on digital transformation, don't even have an electronic signature, couldn't sign a contract, couldn't get some piece of work done because they have to go to office and they can't go to office. Uh, uh, we had a customer uh, who, who basically had to go to office to clear the bills. And this is a company, again, that spends like pretty much millions on digital transformation, right? Uh, that is one piece. Second, you know, as we are in this, I would say, experiment that everybody, you know, a painful experiment at that, but everybody is working from home. And, and basically, collectively, we're realizing a lot of functions we thought could not be done remotely. Actually, all and any can be done remotely. So does it mean that by doing work remotely, you can actually get better productivity and better cost points uh, and better employee experience? Well, uh, you know, a great example is I'm hearing innovation in the call center space where they're talking about technologies which kind of cancel background noise and allows people to work from home. Uh, you know, do you need real estate uh, or do you need to really focus your energies in specific buildings and special locations in specific countries for call centers or you can pretty much, you know, do that work from anywhere, right? 
uh, so that that is happening and that this experiment has proven to companies and to leadership and i would say even rackspace leadership that a distributed workforce can be made to work to your advantage right and that you know will mean that portions that we thought could not be done could be done electronically and hence the whole thing around digital transformation and then finally you know the the views on video conferencing document sharing again uh, while these technologies are you know, microsoft teams or skype uh, or slack you know all those technologies are available and yet even you know some of the large organizations do not have that uh, in a very wide manner uh, to collab for help to help employees collaborate with each other right and that is another area where each company will have to look at you know so it's you know your your the traditional bcp plans used to be what are the scenarios i will run it and if one office is closed how can i get seats in a small office so that at least my leadership team can go but this is about how what happens if nobody can actually leave their home and go to any office and how do we work which means you know there is money to be had to be made in that digital transformation and again the value prop is not because we are all used to working from home the value prop is there is just so much productivity um, and cost savings from you know from doing things and not spending 2 hours in commute in some parts of the world and people are saying hey i would love to work for companies which allow me to do that right and i'm talking about you know i've been talking to my friends in philippines and india people that i've kind of you know grown and worked with people who used to spend 2 hours commute one way and they never thought that they could do the work outside of office and they're realizing that actually they they're able to do that work and they're saving 4 hours a day from commute right so so every single industry i would say and uh, look the, uh, couldn't uh, couldn't agree more phil i uh, the, the 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 only caveat i have on that is because different countries came into this at different times and have come out and gone to different depths uh take the construction industry and in a lot of countries the construction industry was one of the few industries that kept going So in Australia you can still yeah the construction industry talking to participants hasn't really been impacted particularly current and existing jobs so in other markets the construction industry has had to shut down here in Australia we have no transportation yeah Qantas is running at 1% of schedule you know so for some industries it, it's the weight of what's happening in the transportation retail uh, hospitality is just at an order of magnitude beyond what you could have comprehended and i think that's the important thing that not all all industries are impacted uh, particularly from a working from home and cultural but economically there are just some industries there that will never recover in the way they were you know things like airline yeah you know, a lot of airlines in asia are quasi nationalized anyhow yeah that's going to be the one thing that will make sure that a lot of these airlines still exist in 2021 whereas for other markets a lot of the airlines are just going to have to fall you know fall to market forces which when you don't travel doesn't you don't exist so i think the uh yeah every industry is impacted but on the recovery there will be some industries that accelerate a lot faster than others and there's got to be a lot of creativity um that happens uh there's talk of a travel block between firstly australia and new zealand and then looking at taiwan south korea uh Singapore potentially if they can get things under control again just to expand this travel block of Southeast Asian and ANZ countries just to open up just a little bit by little bit so hopefully that's a way way forward for um uh, a lot of us as well and we'll probably open up new new concepts from a holiday point of view you might not have thought of Taiwan or South Korea as a holiday option but if you have very little choice then you may well um, get to enjoy those places Yeah, look, it's interesting you 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 mentioned the travel industry Phil because um I think from a um from a transformation perspective I think there there's going to be a case for some of these industries to completely evolve their business models. Right? I mean, who would A case they have no choice. That's yeah. yeah. I mean, it is is I'm I'm hoping that Boeing and Airbus um and some of the other manufacturers are thinking about a um a, a different model where you know they're giving aircraft as a service to their customers because i don't know if you we saw I, i read yesterday the hundreds of aircraft parked at Alice Springs in Australia and there was 1500 plus aircraft parked by different airlines in the desert in Arizona 
Um, and I mean, we know, for example, Singapore Airlines has some aircraft parked in Alice Springs, right? Yeah. And, and that is just so much capital asset sitting there, depreciating and probably um, genuinely um, rotting as well over, over time if they don't get utilized because they're mechanical products. But so I think there's, there's, there's a need to, to think of, you know, complete pivoting in, in certain, certain industries. But I'm going to come back to, to Phil on this whole shift in patterns of working, right? What, what, what Sandeep talked about, you know, he referred to the contact center industry and industry at large where people are working from home and starting to find it quite effective, right? Um, but with that shift to work from home, um, what is the impact that you see um, in terms of the adoption of cloud? I mean, what, what should we be thinking of? Uh, I, I think it's, I think there are two things working in parallel. So obviously the way we work has been changing for, you know, constantly changing and you're getting more autonomy and cloud just accelerates that. We couldn't, we could not have had this discussion five years ago doing a video conference um, across the cloud and be confident it was going to work. Uh, there would be buffering at every minute. So the, the cloud is just given the capacity to do this and to do it at speed. Yeah, you know, from a rec space point of view, from your customers needing to go from yeah, a confined local network to the cloud, it can be done in two minutes. You can do these things so rapidly and that just enables the working from home to happen. And your yeah, you know, cloud providers are global. Your employees are global. It doesn't matter whether they're in Singapore, Sydney, or in my case, a, you know, a farm in rural New South Wales. We are all still working with the same technology and the same productivity because it just shows that um, yeah, the cloud tools uh, enable that accelerated business outcomes. And you know, whether it's infrastructure as a service, whether it's an AWS Azure model or a Salesforce SaaS model, Workday, you know, these tools are in place. These tools can be enacted very, very quickly for employees. You can work with governance. You can get your online document signing um, capabilities that mean you can sign a document legally anywhere, anytime. We just didn't have that five, 10 years ago. Um, the, the key outcome of this and what's going to save us is the timing. You know, if this happened 10 years ago, economies would be in a much deeper hole than what they are because we, we have cloud. We have digital, we have data-driven decision-making. We didn't have that um, to anywhere near that same extent a year ago, let alone 10 years ago. So I think that's uh, very, very important to, to be aware that that's enabling us doing working from home or if we've got children studying from home or mahjong from home, which my mother always, also does. Yeah, there's an awful lot of things that we just couldn't do five, 10 years ago uh, without the technology that we have today. And it's been driven significantly by the cloud, if not, if not exclusively by the cloud. Are there any sort of pitfalls we need to be aware of, Phil? Because there's oh, some certainly, very quickly. Certainly uh, security and privacy are incredibly important. And I think the governance and compliance. You know, a number of contracts that uh, specified employees where they had to be. They had to be in a certain office in a certain location. Well, that doesn't work. So you need to adjust contracts so you're not in breach of contract. But certainly the security, the privacy and the governance, um, both at an individual level and at an enterprise level is incredibly important. The platforms you use, we've, you know, we're using Zoom now. Uh, we've seen Zoom transform itself over the last six weeks or so from a security point of view because there are obvious holes and breaches in it. Um, so I think it's that whole being aware of security. Your employees have to be aware and you have to be aware at a corporate level that you need to, you're not casual. You're working from home. You're still the 100% professional you were before. You can't sit, you can sit back and wear any clothes you want. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what room you're sitting in, but you can't have that approach that I'm going to be lacking in my security because I'm working from home. I'm going to cross pollinate into Facebook and social media at the same time as I'm working on a, uh, a private piece of work for a client. You have to maintain that. Uh, professional break between what you do as a professional and what who you are as a as an individual, and that's that's where a fair bit of risk lies. And but that risk also lies whether you're working in your office or whether you're working on an aeroplane, um, or whether you're working from home as well. Yeah, no, uh, that, that's that's a really good point. And and Sandeep, 
on that note, I can't imagine that um, things would have been easy because you've got to keep uh, your customers, you've got to help your customers keep their business running, their wheels turning. Um, I mean, what are some of the steps that, at Rackspace, what are some of the steps that you know, you've taken to um, enable this transition uh, for your customers to an optimized cloud infrastructure? See, we, uh, we are a multi-cloud company, right? So our, our origin was in web hosting, uh, co-location private cloud and uh, you know over the last many years we've moved migrated more to uh, working with the hyperscalers uh, to help customers on their on the journey right to whichever flavor of cloud um, so one one portion was to make sure that our data centers are up and running right uh, you know in march we actually migrated our data centers in hong kong uh, we did that uh, with people who had flown in from us uh, right in the middle of that you know uh, 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 the situation in Hong Kong, and we did it without any downtime and without any problems. Right? What we we did was all around our data centers. We made sure that we had the right policies and procedures of accessing the data center, making sure the data centers were sanitized, uh, uh, making sure that the customers understood that uh, you know segregation needs to be maintained and not everything needs a physical inspection, and only the most critical things would be allowed. And and we've seen, you know, all around our data centers, we've been, and we also looked at what work can actually be done remotely uh, and what work can be done from another data center premise, right? And so we had shifts. Uh, we made sure that people were in shifts, you know, if, if let's say one shift was infected, the other was able to take on the data center. So we did all of that to make sure that we had no outage. And, you know, we've been doing this like since March, two months now, two and a half months. We've had no outage. We've had no problems because uh, one of our staff got infected, couldn't turn up for work, or for whatever other reason, right? Uh, so that's you know, and I would say touch wood, but that's what we maintain. The second uh, place where we maintained, um, you know, we managed this is we worked with customers to figure out what was actually was going to be the point of you know focus for them, right? A lot of customers had to move into work from home pretty much, you know, on a moment's notice, right? And like in Singapore, you remember people were still doing office A, office B. A lot of customers were doing that. And suddenly, pretty much overnight, people were told, sorry, no more office now. Not office A, B, no more office. And, and a number of customers came to us about how actually they do that. How do they do collaboration? How do they do video conferencing? And we help them through that. And the third thing is, you know, in some industries like cinemas and gym ownerships and so on, we saw the demand just completely go down. In other industries like healthcare, the demand just went up. The, the demand for a compute power just went up. But that didn't mean the revenue scale up with that demand, right? Uh, and, and so we work with the customers on both ends of the spectrum on how to get the best use of the technology. For people who are experiencing pretty much no business, how could they just continue the bare minimum lights on without having the rest of the you know, spend? And for customers who are like growing rapidly in consumption, but didn't really have the revenues to support, how do you use you know, public cloud? How do you optimize public cloud so that you don't really have to pay that much, right? And that, by the way, that included our own private cloud. So we worked with customers on both sides of the spectrum. And those were, the, those were the two themes, and the third theme was security. So, you know, bad actors didn't really stay still. In fact, I think they had more time on their hands in this crisis. Oh, I, 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 that's a fair point. That yeah, the uh, the acceleration in um, people of disrepute in this space in the last in April was yeah you know, from April one to April thirty. That acceleration was pretty scary. Yeah. And, and though that is the third place where we work with our customers, you know, especially uh, people who didn't really have a security posture or a comprehensive security posture. Uh, that's the third area that we worked in. Right? And we, we're looking with interest on what this term of securing the home is, because that's where this is evolving. You know, three people working for three different companies on a single uh, broadband network at home. You know, how do you, how do you make sure that each of those companies are protected? So, so we're keeping an eye on what does that mean. And did this involve you working across the entire sort of um, stakeholder group and the client organization? Or was it specifically with the IT organization? 
So, you know, uh, uh, in some instances, we worked, uh, so in some, we worked across the board, right? Uh, you know, we understood which industries were in distress. Uh, the, the conversations that were happening around cost savings or cost optimization were really driven by the CEO and the CFO. Uh, and we, we, we worked with those stakeholders to figure out how to optimize, right? But, you know, we have a very long tail of customers, you know, customers who spend a minimal amount or not a, not a big amount. And with that, the conversation was mostly with uh, the IT, IT director, IT manager. So, you know, whole range, right? For the largest customers, absolutely. And Phil, do you see sort of, um, do you see an, um, a shift in how those engagements are taking place in the industry for cloud service providers? Yeah, I think it is, it is going up, you know, We've always aspired for it to go up the layer of the organization into the business, but this imperative that has touched every asset of the business, supply chain, human capital, um, yeah, customer experience, nothing has been untouched. Your customer experience has to change, whether it's a call center, whether you're a traditional retailer, because every facet of your business has changed, you know, as Sandeep said, overnight, essentially. It just has accelerated that, that discussion and the importance that technology you can play to do that. Um, it's, it's just front and center. If, if an executive now doesn't think that technology is going to be important for their business, then I don't think they're going to be an executive too much longer in any organization. It, it's, it's, it's the, and we're biased, we are in technology, but it is the one thing that is going to um, accelerate enterprises back on their feet is the application of technology. And the organizations that had poor technology before this, are still going to have poor technology after this and are going to struggle unless they've made dramatic transformation across the organization. There's, there's no room to hide anymore. Yeah. Again, it doesn't matter what industry you are. If you're poor at technology, you have nowhere to hide and you will have nowhere to hide as we go back to um, whatever the future, you know, whatever we call the future. Back to the or future. We go to whatever, whatever. Yeah, we go to the future. Obviously, we're not going back to the future anymore. Um, but look, um, obviously this has imp implications on the talent pools that companies should be looking at, right? Oh, ab absolutely. Um, there's going to be a lot of talent changing their, uh, you know, their employment models and you, you're going to have to understand, do you retrain existing skills into a cloud environment? Do you look to hire new, perhaps younger generations who haven't had a legacy of doing things the old way in the, in, in the old world of, you know, February, 2020. And so it's going to be a bit of a, a, a bit of a 22. You're going to need that experience and that capability and retrain those employees, but you're also new people with new perspectives are going to be very important as you become a cloud based digital based organization. So that how you manage your employees and retrain existing employees and bring in new employees is going to be very, very important to maximize that technology understanding. Yeah, I no, completely agree. Now, um, you know, it's, it's interesting just looking at us do this video, right? And this video is going to be edited and we have a team of people doing this uh, in the business, but I'm pretty sure if, if, I, um, if I gave it to um, young kids who are creating those TikTok videos, they'd probably do a pretty good job and very quickly. <laughs> so I think- we'd only have 15 seconds. We'd only have 15 <laughs> seconds though. Well, it might be a good thing. I <laughs> know. Uh, look, as long as it's only cutting out my fifth, you know, my, my time, I think we should, we've got to keep your, um, you know, what, what you guys are saying. It's very profound and useful for the industry. Um, but just shifting gears a little bit, um, you know, we talked about the future, and you know, the future we know is automation. Yeah, and maybe to get some thoughts from Sandeep on, uh, you know, the the shift to automation in uh, the whole cloud integration space. I mean, do you have some thoughts on that, Shay Sandeep? Uh, I mean, I would ask you a clarifying question. So it's um, automation in general in the industry using cloud technologies or as people migrate to cloud, how that migration could be automated? Which of which? Well, this was Phil's question. Phil. Uh, but yeah, obviously, uh, the second one is a subset of the former. Okay. Yeah, the overall shift to automation for me is absolutely critical because yeah. you know, human capital is inefficient. We th I, I hate saying the word human capital because it makes us humans redundant, but yeah, uh, labor can be inefficient. So it's that whole shift <laughs> and a, subs a subset of that is the migration to cloud. 
you know, from a speed cost point of view to automate. So, okay. so uh, uh, Phil, I would say, you know, I, I've, I've, I've always been in two minds about automation, right? Precisely because of the reasons that you said about you know, human capital and are we making ourselves even better, right? But what this uh, environment has taught us is, are there industries that are too vulnerable to human touch, right? If humans are not there to push buttons, would we would we get our electricity? Would we get our water? Would we get our you know meats processed? Would we get our home deliveries, right? Uh, and there would be industries where you would have, you know, large degrees of uh, automation that would be required uh, to make them as human independent as possible. Because, you know, the future of humans actually depend on those industries performing, even if none of us really could get out of it. Right now, the thing is, would we really learn that lesson after the and after the pandemic is finished? And you know, once we are back into our daily mode, would we spend the money and time and energy on all of that? I don't know. But that's, you know, that's like the big picture, more philosophical question. At a practical note, uh, you know, uh, there are a couple of things that I gave you, uh, you know, that are thinking, right? I was thinking, I, there are lots of movies that have not got released because of the pandemic. The cinemas are not open. Distributors don't want to have incur a loss. But you know, like Hoyts in Australia is starting to home deliver popcorns and candies and so on. Uh, Singtel has you know an, a channel where you can actually do watch video on demand. What what will it take for cinemas to create an application or work with telcos and just say, look, here's a new movie. It's fifty fifty dollars per pop. You know, per family. You can be a family of two or you can be a family of six. Uh, what would it take? Right? Uh, would we pay for that? Would we pay for that latest content? You know, now. Yes, we will. Uh, you know, similarly, an example. I have to activate a credit card with a bank of, uh, you know, with a bank in Singapore, and they want me to visit the branch because they have my old number and they can't update my new number on the phone. So I have to visit a branch, and you know, people will have to really think about. It. And then, and then they, on top of it, they keep sending me these weekly reminders to uh, activate my credit card and what more benefits I could get. But I can't really do it because I have to visit the branch, right? Yeah. But that is where, you know, would I, that, would I really even consider, you know, using them in the future because they have actually prohibited me from using banking services, right? But this is where each of the companies will have to figure out how do they use the digital technology? How do they use the automation to actually serve their customers? Um, you know, and people who will be successful will win that mind share because this experience will remain, you know, at least for the next year, 10 years in this generation's mind of what happened in these situations. Yeah. And how, how, yeah, it takes yeah 10 years to build a reputation and two minutes to lose it. And that's probably yeah. even accelerated. Yeah. One tweet could destroy your company's reputation um, and has Correct. in a few cases. Um, it's interesting on that, on that point you just made about, uh, almost the accuracy of the data. You know, there's a, an airline uh, frequent fire program that my son is part of. And before Christmas, they offered him six bottles of wine at a reduced rate of 20,000 points. The only problem was he was 17 at the time and had about 400 frequent fire points. So one, was it not only illegal for him to actually have that wine, um, let alone what his father would say, but he had 400 points, not the 20,000 required. It just shows that, you know, all the data in the world doesn't help you from, um, you know, not helping your customers. And I think in the future, you know, if that sort of process is automated, it needs to be automated very accurately. Otherwise, you're going to alienate, you know, customers, whether they're 17-year-olds or, or, or much older. Um, and I think, I think that's going to be key. But I think we will shift towards automation um, in a lot of industries, contact centres, in um, yeah, just migration to cloud. Yeah, it shouldn't take um, you know twenty consultants to migrate to cloud. Your consultants should be doing the value add, the high value, business outcome related work rather than um, yeah punching code. Um, and obviously, AWS is a big partner of yours and yeah, a rather important player in the public cloud. Yeah, they do have a no touch point of view from a human. You know, if if they can possibly. Uh, yeah, get away with it. 
Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, I would I would just add to you know on this. Uh, you you asked Phil that question about training existing people or hiring new. And I would say you know you really need a mixture of. Yeah. yeah. You know, in these new technologies, the churn rate of employees is so high because the demand of for people in specific economies is really high. And you can find, um, you know, the cost pressures for companies can pretty much, you know, take them away from the market. And so, you know, it is always good for companies to invest in people, uh, you know, at least a, a special, uh, a particular population of the people. Get, because you will get the loyalty, you will get the knowledge, and then complement it with younger people. And that mix, if you can perfect that mix, you know, that would be the optimum, right? But if you just depend on new hires, um, we are seeing, you know, people in two, three years can command much more somewhere else that you would want to get, yeah. right? Yeah, no, completely. Yeah, you, you get in a death cycle there from a cost point of view. You just, you know, yeah, you keep running into, you know, a corkscrew down. Yeah, so gentlemen, um, this has been a wonderful session. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, any sort of last words of wisdom from either of you before we wrap up? Uh, for, stop saying new normal. I think if we all stop saying new normal, because you know, that we tie that back to the old normal, but it's just, we still don't know what the extent of this is going to be, you know, both from a, a health point of view, an economic point of view, and an individual employee point of view. So. Don't sit and think that this is all over or all the changes that are going to come have come. Uh, this is, yeah, as we've all said, this is a long-term shift in us as consumers, us as employees, us as, as stakeholders in our society. And uh, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the game hasn't played out yet and won't for a long time. Yeah. And for me, you know, take it one day at a time. You know, don't think too much in the future. Uh, deliver the value that you can deliver today and then start all over again tomorrow. Yes. And if you stay in the present, then you can deal with the future, whatever the future throws at you. Absolutely. Exactly. Very, very profound words from both of you. Uh, so, Sandeep, uh, effectively, if you survive today, focus on survival today and you'll th thrive uh, in the future. Uh, this has been a wonderful session. I've uh, been joined by um, the Managing Director of Rackspace, Sandeep Bhargav, and uh, Phil Hassi who's uh, one of the most well-regarded technology analysts uh, across the world in the space of digital transformation, service delivery models, and automation. So thank you, gentlemen. Stay well, stay safe, uh, for, um, and I wish well for your teams and your families. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Amit.